Dr. Robert Smith lived a privileged life in apartheid-era South Africa. He had attended Oxford on a Rhodes Scholarship before returning to South Africa to earn a PhD in economics from the University of Stellenbosch. He held a senior position at Santam International, a corporation used as a front to defy international sanctions against South Africa. At the age of 34, he became the youngest ever Deputy Secretary of Finance in South Africa's Treasury Department, and he went on to become the country's ambassador to the International Monetary Fund in Washington, D.C. In 1977, Dr. Smith, whose main residence was in Pretoria, rented a home in the town of Springs so that he could run to be elected the area's member of parliament. Had he been elected, he was expected to be given a high-level position within the National Party government, potentially finance minister. The White's only election was scheduled for November 30th, 1977. Smith was expected to make an easy victory. Just after 6 p.m. on the night of November 22nd, Smith's wife, Jean Cora, was driven to the home in Springs by the family's driver, Daniel Shabalala. Daniel made himself dinner while Mrs. Smith watched television. She walked Daniel out of the house just before seven and locked the door behind him. Shortly thereafter, she called her husband's receptionist to ask if he was still in his campaign office because guests had arrived to speak with him. Dr. Smith drove away from his office just before 8 p.m. At 7 a.m. the next morning, Daniel Shabalala discovered the bodies of both Jean Cora and Robert Smith. They had both been shot multiple times and stabbed. The phrase Rao Tem had been written across the kitchen cabinets in red spray paint. Dr. Smith's briefcase was missing. Based on the autopsies and the locations where the bodies were discovered, police were able to theorize what happened the night of the murders. Mrs. Smith died several hours before her husband and was discovered near the phone. Based on the locations of her injuries, it appears that after she hung up the phone with her husband's receptionist, she turned around and was shot, holding her hand up to her face before she fell. Dr. Smith was shot as he entered the home around 9 p.m., once to incapacitate him and then twice to the head. Mrs. Smith had been stabbed 14 times post-mortem with a stiletto knife, which was then thrust into her husband's back. It has been theorized that the stab wounds were inflicted and the odd words written some two hours after Dr. and Mrs. Smith were shot. It is believed that these actions were taken to cover up the fact that the killings were political assassinations because they made the killer look like an unstable and deranged person. The meaning of Rao Tem has been highly speculated about, but has never been deciphered. While it is believed that there were multiple killers involved in the crime, Mrs. Smith spoke of guests at her home that day, and the fatal bullets came from two different types of gun. The identities of those killers remains unknown. It is widely believed, however, that Dr. Smith was killed by South Africa's Bureau of State Security at the behest of his own political party, the National Party. Several cabinet members and members of the security force have been accused over the years of having played a role in the murders, but not enough evidence has ever been found to bring criminal charges. The most long-standing theory for the crime has been the belief that Robert Smith was about to go public with information about wide-scale financial fraud within the South African government. It has been alleged that he uncovered everything from offshore accounts made up of money siphoned off from the government budget to state-sanctioned payouts made to U.S. senators and CIA agents. If there were any evidence of such wrongdoing on the behalf of the National Party government, it presumably vanished in Dr. Smith's briefcase. The Smith's son and daughter, Liza and Robert, testified to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission after the fall of apartheid in hopes that the commission could help uncover the reason why their parents were killed. In their final report, the TRC declared that Robert and Jean Cora were killed by members of South African security forces and that their deaths were a gross violation of human rights. They could not identify the exact perpetrators or the true motive of the crime. Liza Smith released a book in 2018 detailing her own investigations into her parents' case 
and the troubling behavior she's encountered from government officials because of them. Jane Marie Pritchard loved the outdoors since her childhood, which was spent on her parents' 38-acre farm in Maryland. She was close with her family, but also strongly independent, driving across the country alone after she finished college. She inherited her mother's love of plants, so it was no surprise to those close to her when she decided to pursue a master's degree in botany. She was enrolled at the Graduate School of the University of Maryland, while also working at a botanical garden. Jane's thesis focused on a summer vine known as a hog peanut, specifically on the way the vine's leaves would turn towards the sun. Her research required her to spend a lot of time doing fieldwork in Blackbird State Forest in Delaware. By September of 1986, she was months away from finishing the thesis and receiving her degree. On September 20th, she arrived at the State Forest by 7 a.m. and set up her equipment behind her truck, extending some 30 feet into the woods. At 5.30 that afternoon, a couple from Perth Amboy, New Jersey, taking a walk around the forest, discovered Jane's partially clothed body 20 feet away from her extensive research setup. She had been shot in the back with a shotgun. She was only 28 years old. There had been a large number of hunters in the forest that day, so at first glance it appeared that Jane's death could have been an accident. However, the fact that she was found partially clothed pointed to a much more sinister scenario. Perhaps someone had tried to sexually assault her, and then shot her when she tried to run away. Police had little to go on early in the case. They searched Jane's blue and white Chevrolet blazer for evidence, but had no success. Their most useful piece of evidence proved to be Jane's field notebook. Jane had kept minute-by-minute minute notes of her research. The notes abruptly stopped right before 10 a.m. This allowed investigators to pinpoint a time for the crime and better utilize eyewitnesses. Over 300 people were interviewed in relation to the murder. A man called police the Monday after the murder to tell them he had been hunting squirrels in Blackbird State Forest on the day of the murder. At around 10 a.m., the time when Jane's field notes stopped, he had seen Jane talking to another hunter. He helped develop a composite sketch of the man. Police grew suspicious of the squirrel hunter because they claimed there were inconsistencies in his story. In October 1986, the witness was arrested and charged with Jane's murder and held without bail. A single foreign hair had been found at the crime scene, and police hoped that forensic testing would prove that the suspect they had in custody was in fact the murderer. Only a single lab in the country was doing DNA testing at the time, so the hair was sent to California for examination. Instead of proving the hunter's guilt, the hair exonerated him. In August of 1987, charges were dropped against the hunter, and he was released from prison. No other suspect has ever emerged in the case. A plaque in Jane's memory was placed in the gardens where she worked, and one of her professors completed her thesis for her. A cold case unit reopened Jane's case in 2015, but as of 2018, her killer has never been brought to justice. Matthew Pendergrast grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. He was only 5 foot 6 inches tall and 115 pounds, but he still excelled in athletics, serving as goalie for his soccer team and running varsity cross country in high school. When he enrolled at Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee, he planned to take a pre-med course of study so that he could follow in his father's footsteps and become a doctor. However, his plans changed when he took a Spanish class that included a trip to Mexico. He was inspired after the trip to change his major to Spanish. His plans further changed after he spent two summers volunteering with orphans in the Dominican Republic. His new life goal was to start his own foundation to better the lives of orphans. He planned to move back to Atlanta after he graduated to work at a nonprofit to learn the business side of such a venture. On Friday, December 1st, 2000, Matt was just two weeks away from graduation. He had plans to go on a cruise with the family of a friend of his after they finished school before he and his friend would become roommates back in Atlanta. Matthew had been up late the night before, in part because he had acted in a play as part of a course, and in part because he was working on a final paper. 
He had spoken with his friend Gio sometime between 1.30 and 2 a.m. about how best to outline the paper. Around 7.30 a.m., Matt left Gio a message that everything was fine and that he would talk to him later. Matt had a Spanish class that morning at 9 a.m. in a building just a short distance away from the room he rented. However, his landlord heard him leaving between 7.30 and 8. The following afternoon, Matt's mother, Mary Ellen, received a phone call from a man asking for Matt. The man, Joe Murdaugh, explained to Mary Ellen that he had gotten her phone number off of an old oil change receipt in her son's glove compartment. Matt's Toyota 4Runner was parked off of a private road on a levee in a private duck hunting preserve in Lano County, Arkansas, roughly two hours west of Memphis. Joe had not seen the vehicle when he had begun hunting at 10 a.m. the day before, but when he was back on the road at 2 p.m., he had seen it and left a note asking its owner to remove it from his property. When the car was still there after a day had passed, he began to investigate. The car was unlocked and the keys were in the ignition. There was no sign of Matt by the car. In a subsequent search of the area, Matt's clothes, a shirt, jeans, socks, and shoes were found a short distance away. The clothes were found folded neatly in a pile, a detail his mother finds suspicious. Matthew was notoriously sloppy, so if he had discarded his clothes, they probably would have just been tossed aside, she argues. To her, the pile of clothes suggests that the scene was staged by someone else. The other major piece of evidence that raised concerns were Matt's journals, which were found inside his backpack in the Forerunner. They contained various writings and poems about nature, death, immortality, and a group of silver elves. On the surface, these entries seemed to indicate an unknown problem in Matt's life. He was at the right age to start showing signs of schizophrenia, or want to start experimenting with drugs, either of which could have produced hallucinations that may have led him to wander into the woods. There are two facts that lead those close to Matt to dismiss the idea that these journals were significant in Matt's disappearance. The first was the fact that Matt was very creative and liked to write, and the second was the existence of an actual group known as the Silver Elves. The Silver Elves identified as actual elves, and their online presence at the time promoted a variety of mystical and esoteric views. Matt played an online multiplayer video game through a website that had some links to this group, so it is conceivable that he found the Silver Elves website and was simply working through some of their themes in his writing. One entry in particular, however, is still concerning, even with this context. Matt writes about the cold mud in the woods, lying down in icy water, and feeling his blood turn into ice crystals. Matt's vehicle was found near the Bayou Meadow, a large waterway whose waters were rushing near the site in question. Divers did not find anything in their search of the bayou. However, trained dogs were able to pick up Matt's scent going from the pile of clothes left behind to the edge of the water. They could not pick up his scent leading from the car to the clothes. No other sign of Matt was found in the area, despite extensive searches. The bizarre circumstances surrounding Matt's disappearance could indicate any number of scenarios about what became of him, and the mystery of what happened on December 1st, 2000, still endures. Carolyn Wasilewski was just 14 years old in 1954, but lived an edgier life than most young women her age. She bleached her hair and wore heavy makeup, and wore clothes considered short and tight for the 1950s. Carolyn was spirited and gutsy, always looking for new sources of excitement and fun. She was a member of the Drapes, a rockabilly gang in the vein of the Pink Ladies, or T-Birds, from the musical Grease. The Drapes stayed out late and committed petty crimes, but were really only dangerous in that they rebelled against the standards of how quote-unquote respectable young people were supposed to behave at the time. Most of the trouble Carolyn would get into would be considered par for the course of navigating adolescence today. While she lived a very adult lifestyle, she would never have the chance to actually enter into adulthood. On November 8th, 1954, Carolyn told her parents she was going to meet her friend Peggy and then go to the local elementary school to register for dance classes. Carolyn was wearing a tight pink shirt, a black patterned skirt, and a black denim jacket. Her hair was in curlers, covered by a scarf. 
Her outfit seemed out of place for an elementary school, and a quick errand hardly seemed like it would require curling her hair. While her parents suspected Carolyn was not being truthful with her plans for the evening, they let her leave their house on Mardell Avenue in Baltimore at 6.15 p.m. When Carolyn did not return within a few hours, her parents began to worry. They were used to Carolyn's rebellious behavior, but it was not like her to stay out all night. They began to search the neighborhood for her and discover that she had not made it to Peggy's home or to the elementary school. No one would know where Carolyn was until 7 a.m. the following morning. A train engineer on an express train running from Harrisburg to Baltimore noticed something on the tracks up ahead of the train near the Belvedere Bridge, roughly eight miles from Carolyn's home. The train diverted when the engineer began to fear that the object was a body. Tragically, he was correct. It was the body of 14-year-old Carolyn. Written on her right thigh and lipstick was the name Paul. When she was found, Carolyn was missing her shoes and skirt, but her autopsy revealed that she had not been sexually assaulted. It also determined that the cause of her death was a skull fracture. She had not been killed where she was found, and police theorized that she had been thrown onto the tracks from the bridge in hopes that passing trains would damage the body enough to hamper the eventual murder investigation. The site of the actual murder was quickly determined when some of Carolyn's clothing, covered in blood, was found in a lot near her home. Police were not able to ascertain the significance of the name written on Carolyn's body, or why someone would have taken the time to write it on her in the first place. Police quickly had two male suspects in the case, but neither of them was named Paul. The first was a man Carolyn had just testified against in court in a sexual assault trial, but he was able to provide an alibi for 11 p.m. on the 8th, the time at which the medical examiner believed Carolyn had been killed. The second suspect was a man named Ralph Garrett. Garrett was a 45-year-old married man. He lived close to Carolyn's home. A witness reported seeing him talking to Carolyn the night of the murder. The same day he was announced as a formal suspect in the case, Garrett committed suicide. He hung himself with a belt across the street from the lot where Carolyn had been killed. Police did not believe that Garrett's suicide had anything to do with the case. Garrett's mother had passed away recently, so they argued that the timing of his death was purely coincidental. Carolyn's killer, as well as the purpose of the writing on her body, remain unknown. Rose Burkert, 22, and Roger Ackeson, 32, both lived in St. Joseph, Missouri. Rose was a single mother, trained to become a nurse, and Roger was a telephone crew worker. Despite the fact that Roger was married, the two were involved in a romantic relationship. On Friday, September 12, 1980, the pair decided to spend the weekend together. Roger's wife, Marcella, was told that the time he was actually spending with Rose was part of a two-week work trip. They ended up near Williamsburg, Iowa, looking for a hotel room to share. They attempted to get a room at the Amana Holiday Inn along Interstate 80, but were originally told that the hotel was at capacity due to a mortician's conference being hosted there. The desk agent double-checked the register and realized that there had been a last-minute cancellation, leaving room 260 available. Rose and Roger checked into the room at 7.40 p.m. The following day, a maid knocked on the door of room 260, but got no answer. Finding the door locked, she retrieved a passkey and entered the room. The sight she discovered could only be described as gruesome. Blood spatter covered the headboard and the walls, and the bodies of both Rose and Roger were lying face down in the bed. Their subsequent autopsies would show that they both died from extensive head trauma after being beaten with a hatchet or a similar instrument. Roger's hands showed extensive defensive wounds. The room had several odd clues. There were two chairs set up near the bed, and there were indications that someone had put their feet up on the nightstand. Near one of the chairs was a pile of soap shavings, apparently from someone whittling down a bar of soap. The soap was then used to write on the mirror in the bathroom. Originally, a longer message had been written, but had been smudged away, with only the word this left decipherable. There was also toothpaste splattered in the bathtub. There were assumptions made in the investigation about who could have carried out the crime that I personally do not agree with. 
It has been argued that Rose and Roger knew their killer because there were no signs of forced entry, and Roger was found wearing only his boxer shorts, arguably because he felt comfortable around the killer. It has also been argued that the chairs could have been set up by the bed because Roger and Rose had chatted with the person or people who killed them while they were still alive. This scenario does not make sense to me personally. I know that I may just be more self-conscious and reserved than other people, but the idea of sitting in bed in my underwear with the person I am having an extramarital affair with while casually chatting with a friend is completely absurd to me. No matter how close I am to someone, this scenario would just never happen. To me, it makes much more sense that either an employee of the hotel with access to the passkey or someone who figured out how to steal the passkey entered the room after Rose and Roger were asleep and committed the crime, moving the chairs afterwards. The television had been on when the maid discovered the bodies, but plenty of people either fall asleep while watching TV or intentionally leave it on to drown out outside noise. Either of those two things happening seems infinitely more likely than Roger answering the door and socializing in his boxer shorts, in bed with his mistress. There have been attempts made to link this crime to similar killings in other parts of the country, but no solid connection has ever been made. To me, this may be due in part to the inexperience of the killer. The overkill could suggest a personal motive, or it could suggest a killer who did not know how much effort it would take to finish the crime. The message on the mirror shows insecurity on his or her part. They had something they thought important enough to write, but then changed their mind and got rid of it, but still left the single word on the mirror. The killer may have sat near the bodies purely because they enjoyed the sight of what they had done, or they just may never have seen dead bodies before. This inexperience may mean that even if the killer went on to commit other crimes, they were still developing patterns and behaviors around them, making them difficult to trace back. Rose allegedly had a fight with the bartender at the hotel the night she checked in. The following day, the bartender left town without collecting his paycheck, abandoned his car, and enlisted in the armed forces and got deployed to Germany before authorities had a chance to speak with him. He has largely been discredited by police as a serious suspect in the crime. While his motive does seem trivial, especially relative to the brutality of the murders. He is the only suspect who definitely knew where the couple was staying and could have gained access to their room. The other two major suspects in the case are popular because of how violent they were, but practical concerns make it improbable that either of them perpetrated the crime. Roger's uncle-in-law was serial killer Charles Hatcher, who escaped from a mental health facility in Nebraska around the time of the murders. There is, however, no evidence that Hatcher ever left the state of Nebraska, as he was arrested there a few weeks later. Furthermore, his preferred victims were young boys. There is also no way he would know that Rose and Roger would be at that specific hotel. Roger's connection to Hatcher is probably simply coincidental. The other suspect is Rose's ex-boyfriend, who was a violent drug addict who was stalking her and may have been responsible for the grisly death of the dog Rose had gotten to protect herself and her child. He has an obvious motive, but he had what police considered to be a solid alibi. He also passed a polygraph, although that does not necessarily prove anything. Like Hatcher, the major problem with him as a suspect is how we would know where Rose and Roger would be that night when they themselves did not know where they would be staying right up until when they checked in. It is unknown who originally was booked in room 260 that night, and if anyone had a motive to harm them. To me, this could potentially be an important avenue of investigation in solving this case that has been cold for almost 40 years. Please let me know in the comments if you agree or disagree with me about my thoughts on this case.